It's been a really exciting year being here. Um, I love uh, being back on the broader Columbia campus and community. Uh, I was an undergrad at Columbia myself, uh, so sort of coming home uh, in a way that's been nice. And um, really have been enjoying working with the students here. Several of the students are in the room, and I appreciate them being here. Um, you're in for a treat with this talk as well. Uh, and you know, it's just really exciting to be able to build something, to grow uh, something, and uh, especially to um, support our computer science students, but also to engage in world-class computer science research, to develop innovative you know, pedagogy, and to, um, because we have uh, already a, a very rich and robust program with Columbia, we can focus on um, also how you bring computer science across the curriculum to all students. So uh, very exciting. And um, this distinguished lecture series uh, is a way for us to bring leaders in computer science from elsewhere to Barnard to share their work uh, with the Barnard community. And I couldn't think of anyone better than Deborah Estrin uh, to be our first distinguished lecture speaker. Um, I've known Deborah for quite some time and uh, followed her work. She is uh, a professor at Cornell Tech uh, in, <coughs> excuse me, in computer science, where she's also uh, associate dean for impact at Cornell Tech. Uh, and um, she had founded uh, many um, programs around data and the use of data for, um, for, for good, for good purposes. So health, the Health Tech Hub. Um, she directs the Small Data Lab at Cornell Tech. Um, she uh, was a co-founder of a nonprofit startup, Open M Health, around mobile health data, and the founding director of the National Science Foundation Center for Embedded Sen Network Sensing uh, at UCLA. So all of these around sort of the thread of, of data and how it can be collected and used in ways that can benefit society. Um, she was also chosen as a MacArthur Fellow Foundation Foundation Fellow um, in 2018. And um, it's really just a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you here to Barnard Denver. Uh, so thank you. Um, I was smiling to myself when you said to bring uh, computer scientists by all over the first, and, and you thought of me. I'm probably also the closest computer scientist who's not at Columbia, <laughs> since I live on 120th and Malcolm X. So um, I'm delighted to be here, even if I had, had to travel across the country. And um, I. Uh, really commend you for your excellent taste in bringing uh, Rebecca as a leader here to build this. So um, somebody with uh, uh, great taste and great skill and intellect and a great heart. So uh, a good way to start. Um, so I um, am always sort of interested in people's stories. Um, anybody who had a conversation with me, I somehow always need to know like where you were, where did you come from, what are you doing? And this is a, something I put together a while ago when somebody asked me to introduce myself. And um, uh, somebody I won't bother explaining, some of you might recognize the person in the upper left. Um, I was, I will explain. Um, I was, uh, uh, out of high school I was nominated the glorious stitum of my graduating class. So I take that as a, a badge of some sort. Um, that I can particularly uh, brag about here. So, uh, what I, why I really put this up is I'll sort of follow some of this uh, ordering in telling you about uh, some work, some of which is older, but the, it, it, it tells a story. So participatory sensing, I'll tell you what it is in a moment, came out of doing mission-driven research in the ecological and environmental monitoring uh, space. And, uh, I'll talk about that and how it surfaced an opportunity to work in human systems and particularly in health, and talk about some of the work in novel uses of mobile and IoT in the context of health, some of the open research challenges, and assuming I'm a, I have time, I'll mention a little bit of an advertisement and uh, share a little bit about uh, the campus with you. So I don't really like watching videos and I really don't like it when people stand up and give a talk and show me a video. Nevertheless, <laughs> I got to show you this video <laughs> that we made in 2008, um, which means we probably started to make it in 2007. It's quite a while ago. And it was with a colleague of mine, Mark Hansen. Um, and I'll just show Every some of it. Every day, each of us makes hundreds of choices. Some become habits. And billions of these choices and habits woven together create a pattern that is our life. How can we discover these patterns? 
what we learn if we could see all that data unfolding right before our Nokia. eyes? Nokia. When Nokia make was really hot. Differently? Our global society carries more than 2 billion mobile phones. With them, we run our businesses, talk to our families, send photos to friends, and browse the internet. These phones are already full of sensors, such as cameras, microphones, and GPS, that observe our surroundings and can provide a trace of location during a jog, or a car trip, or a whole day. Examining these individual <laughs> traces through various scientific models can give us a profound new understanding of the world around us. This is the breakthrough called participatory sensing, where communities use mobile phones to gather data about things that are important to them. The and it goes into an advertisement about the center, so I'll stop it there. Uh, that was put together by um, Jeff Burke, a colleague at, uh, at, at UCLA. Mark Hansen contributed a lot to it. And uh, it helped us articulate this idea that became, you would be, we grew, uh, grew to call it like crowdsourcing and uh, geocoded images. And it was in a, but it was really uh, early on. And it came out of engaging in application mission driven technical research. And that was not really embraced so much and still to various extents is embraced within the computer science discipline. I'm an experimentalist. So always have been great respect for theoreticians, just am not one by nature. And when you do experimental work, and particularly in, a, in, in the area of computer science, computing is applicable sort of everywhere. It's what's so magical about it. But it also means that when you just follow your technical sense, and if you're an experimentalist, you can end up doing a lot of stuff that never has any relevance to anybody, which for theory, doesn't matter, but for experimentalists and system builders really does. So when you sort of think about the science of the artificial, I don't know if that's anything that you guys touch upon in your, as you study computer science, that's what computer science is. And to ground it and connect it a little bit more to mission-driven work helps you, helped me learn to pursue things that actually mattered. And in the years that uh, we were pursuing the center that Rebecca mentioned on embedded network sensing, I brought together computer scientists and electrical engineers and statisticians, Mark Hansen was back at UCLA with me at the time, to build experimental new kinds of instruments for ecologists and environmental engineers who were trying to study and model ecosystems at a much finer granularity than you could do with their prior instruments. When you sort of look at something with remote sensing from a satellite, a pixel, tells you, well, you can get a lot of pixels of the, of the Earth below you, but each pixel is sort of an average over a pretty wide area. And when you're trying to understand finer scale phenomenon, you need to go in and actually place larger distributed sensor arrays. And so we were developing the system concepts and algorithms behind those distributed sensor arrays. Uh, and how do you analyze that data? It's very noisy. Uh, it's, uh, it's lossy. It's variable. It's sometimes adaptive in its sensing, particularly if the, if, the, if the sensors are being moved around or moving around. And uh, so we started in this space of ecosystems and came to, one of the things we came to was the need to pursue, in fact, mobile sensing. Because when you place a sensor in the environment and you're measuring something, maybe it's something about CO2, maybe you're measuring something about that the, the details about temperature and light uh, inside of a, a, a part of the, uh, the rainforest to try to understand what might happen as you get uh, invasive species growing instead of native, uh, uh, native ones. Um, as you do that, every sensor you place is sort of an opportunity cost because wherever it is sensing, there are all those places it's not. So that particular point in space better really have a lot to tell you over time to have a sensor there. So we started exploring, and with a colleague, uh, Bill Kaiser, UCLA at the time, we started exploring more robotic sensors that could move, this is a little picture of it, sort of hung on an aerial cable, to let you move a sensor through the environment so that you can capture a plane or 
if we had drones at the, at the time, it would have been a volume, and now it's starting to happen with drones. And that whole notion of moving away from this, what was a lovely idea of massively distributed sensor dust um, to a more practical and effective uh, combination of sensing and mobile sensing came out of authentically working with applications that we really cared about. And so rather than thinking of, uh, um, of computer science, um, at the time, I even had an NSF uh, review committee, I won't name the person's name, uh, a high level person who was visiting and giving us a site visit said, doesn't it bother you that you're really sort of just acting as the handmaiden of science? Weird thing to hear. I still, each time I repeat it in a talk, it's still bounce about in my head. And I, my response was that I, first of all, when it's important science and we're enabling new understanding of things, no, it doesn't bother me at all. And moreover, it's through trying to do something real that has objectives in the real world that pushes you back and that sort of those constraints are what drive you to develop new techniques. Because without any constraints, for an experimentalist in particular, a system builder, it, you, you don't have as much to do. You don't have, um, uh, you don't have challenges. All of, the, all of the constraints in the world uh, become our challenges. So through this process, one of the things it brought us to, because mobile became so valuable, that when programmable mobile phones appeared on the scene in around 2005, 2006, it was, oh, we can use them as mobile sensors. So that's what brought us to thinking about participatory sensing and this idea, because the mobile phones were still being not carried on a cable and not carried by a drone, but by human beings. And we were using the sensing of the human being, the perception of theirs, to decide what images needed to be captured. It was often images. Those images were automatically geocoded and timestamped and uploaded to, um, we called it the web at the time, or a server, right, to the cloud, and became then evidence for whatever it is you were trying to study or document. There's an old technique in social science uh, uh, that was developed called uh, photo voice. It's actually a, like a, a technique of activism and community activism to get people to document things particular there to, to their community back in the days of old non-digital uh, cameras. And we really just were taking that idea and we wrote software so that you could have uh, a, a participatory campaign around whatever it is that was particular to you. Something that didn't scale, not a, not a campaign you would run across the country or across the world. So one of our first ones was there were some students on campus who were trying to get the campus to put out more recycling bins. That was at the time when they still actually recycled what was in the recycling bin. I live on a campus right now where it appears that you put things in the recycling bin, but it all goes to the same place. Um, in any case, they wanted to do a campaign of putting out more recycling bins. So we just uh, built a little uh, participatory sensing campaign for them where somebody could download that app and then as they were walking between classes, if they saw a trash can without a recycling bin next to it, they could just take a downward facing image, not rummage through it, if they saw something recyclable. So you know, you see a paper, a can at the top of it, grab an image, automatically geocoded and time stamped. Now that's obvious, all of our images are, even if we maybe don't want them to be. And that would go up to the uh, cloud and then just using GIS, this was probably pre-Google, when was Google Maps? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I think we used OpenStreetMaps at the time. It was when Waze was not, was hated Google Maps and was doing everything with OpenStreetMaps before they were acquired. Anyway, so that idea um, was used in other contexts. We still, I'm still largely working with ecologists and they wanted to map invasive plant species. So that you were t if you're taking a hike, you could help the, help the National Park Service manage and notice early invasive plant species. Uh, invasive plant species are a problem because when they take over too much, they crowd out the local flora, and then you can crowd out, you really start to damage your overall ecosystem, including the birds and the insects and things that were native and dependent on those local, uh, local flora. None of those things are independently particularly important. The idea was 
to allow people to use this technology in a systematic way to explore what was uh, important to them uh, as communities. So um, as things were moving along, there was also, we began to be able to program these mobile phones to not just come up with an app and let somebody take images that would then do something to that image and send it somewhere, but to collect passive data on those phones. Those phones, even back in that simple Nokia day, had several sensors on them, as that participatory sensing video showed, such as accelerometers. Anyone remember? You do not get to answer any questions all the whole time. Uh, why were there accelerometers on early cell phones? They had cameras. Okay, I'm giving you a hint. Yeah? Camera stabilization? They weren't quite there yet. Good, good, good thought, but they didn't get there yet. Uh, it was to... <laughs> It was to, so that when you looked at the viewfinder and you rotated it, it would adjust how the, the orientation of the, of the image. Um, they, weren't very, they weren't great accelerometers, but they were there. So they had microphones, they had cameras, they had accelerometers, and they had Bluetooth. So actually that geocoding initially was coming off board because you had a little Bluetooth-based GPS that, that would uh, geocode the, um, the thing. But by the time we did this, uh, another example of sort of using participatory sensing, we could program the phones to just collect the, um, the, uh, the location data uh, continuously in the background and build what again today seems trite and obvious, a path of where you'd been. But what we used it for was to tell you something about, in this case, we called it the personal environmental impact report. In LA, lots of concerns about air pollution. Um, we used it to infer from it your exposure to particulate matter. Turns out most of your exposure to PM 2.5, which is the problematic particulate matter, happens on freeways when you're around uh, diesel uh, uh, trucks and buses and such. And so we could infer based on models what your exposure was on different routes and different time of day to PM 2.5. And to some extent, some other issues like how much are you generating? So when you drive, when you take side streets and try to avoid uh, traffic-y freeways, uh, and you go by uh, schools and such, just even your braking and everything, is a, and the tires are a form of local pollution that is significant to uh, 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 young people in school. So this is early days. The only time I was ever on Facebook is we created a Facebook widget because we didn't want to share your every moment's location. We thought that was like, no one would want to do that, right? What we wanted to share was just the inference from your location. And so we had some, some high school students were using this to do competitions to see uh, as a class sort of whose class could go greener by reducing how much they took private transportation over public transportation. And they just shared their Facebook widget, not their every moment's location. So it was um, 2008, uh, this was running, and it was an example that incorporated a lot of stuff in it. Doing this kind of passive location tracing, um, doing something that had some privacy by design in it, and trying to make it useful uh, for people. And happened to be, you had to use some machine learning stuff to make the, to smooth out the information and really detect that somebody was driving and things, and things like that. So sometimes when I look at this, I think, I'm not so sure what we've done since. But by doing this, I ended up somewhere else. So part of this narrative, just particular to me. There seems to be a narrative that I've created in ret retrospectively over the set of things I've done. I think that's often how history emerges, right? We place some narrative over the things that have happened, um, but this was by no means some planned, well-executed strategy as to how I decided what I was gonna do. I think uh, the most credit I can take is just being willing to adapt and, uh, and working with great people along the way. So. Those came together, and just a lot, my little last example about participatory sensing, uh, we did something with a bunch of uh, high school students in Boyle Heights, uh, where the where community organization was putting in for funding to a, uh, to a, um, to a foundation to build some youth-oriented uh, community centers, and they used our stuff to do a data campaign to find out where high school kids spent time after school and how they got to school and some of the key things. So they programmed what the questions were 
And the students collected that kind of photo voice evidence about where they were, um, how they got to school, what they ate, uh, who they turned to for advice, at, uh, and what they did after school, where they did their homework, a very important question, do you have a, a quiet place to do your homework? And um, here we used both passive and uh, active data. Um, it was a great, uh, a great experience. Many years later, we ran this on App Engine, uh, another Google tool at the time. And a few years ago, they, they uh, mothball took down whatever expression I should use for App Engine. Again, I don't. I keep looking at you. Sorry. Um, we have a Google or close dear colleague and friend in the audience. Um, so I don't remember what uh, what year they disabled App Engine. But suddenly I was looking at my old Google Photos one day, and I started seeing all these photos. I had no idea what they were. It took me a while. And it was the hundreds of photos that the students took in Boyle Heights, because they were somehow associated with my Gmail account, violating some IRB, I'm certain. Um, uh, but every once in a while, I still stumble across them. So that's what participatory sensing is. We built technology underneath it. It motivated us to do a whole bunch of things like activity classification, and uh, I got involved with computer vision uh, uh, folks uh, because of it. And we really had powerful tools by which we were engaging with the community. Okay. And it just had me wander into this area of health. Because if you're trying, I'm a technologist, so I do tend to follow you know, the lamppost Right, the lamppost is shining here, and I look there, right? And um, the technology that these people were carrying around, what could, where could that data that it was collecting be most meaningful? And for me, that, uh, it, it, for me, it was pretty clear that one of the key places was in the context of health, and in particular, chronic disease. So chronic, just like uh, uh, ecology and environmental engineering was sort of the killer app for that earlier phase of distributed sensing, which led me to participatory sensing, chronic disease management and prevention it, uh, it is clearly both the killer for this uh, country and around the world increasingly, and the killer app. So don't know if you know these kinds of statistics, but um, chronic disease and uh, lifestyle behaviors, so preventable uh, causes of, um, uh, of death, are actually constitute about a third of the mortalities in this country, and um, over a half of the U.S. residents of, of people who live here have one or more chronic disease, and the onset is uh, trending lower. You can go to the CDC and see a whole bunch of stats. So that um, uh, that work, where we started to look at how could we use that same kind of of uh, information from smartphones that. By then, people really were starting to carry it in their pocket, and by then, iPhone had emerged and Android had come after it. So these were smartphones that were much more interesting, much more graphical, and, um, and even easier to uh, develop applications for. We started to think more about how could this really be used in the context of health and healthcare, not just in the context of making a case for a community, but in some sense, making a case for that individual. So when you hear about uh, uh, big data, data science, AI, ML, um, it largely and appropriately has to do with looking at large data sets. And in medicine, using large data sets to better understand uh, predictive uh, analytics, the ability to do diagnosis, the ability to better predict who will do better in one form of treatment than another. And that kind of uh, analysis, all very important and Actually, and Columbia is uh, one of the best places, uh, not just um, in the country, but in the world and, the, and early on in the context of bioinformatics and, and clinical informatics and genomics. All of that is really those kinds of big data uh, techniques. So you're looking across large numbers uh, of, of the data of large numbers of individuals. And not instead of, but just as a complement to, because I was coming with my particular lamppost to mix a metaphor. Um, I was interested in how an individual's data stream, maybe multiple of their data stream over time, could be used to help understand their state of health and even drive uh, interventions that could help them in their, uh, in their care. 
So this sort of idea of small data, where small just refers to small n. This is large n, as in large numbers of individuals. This is small n, as maybe just n equals 1. So how does that actually fit into being useful? Um, so this is also sometimes referred to as patient-generated uh, health data. Uh, first and foremost, just think about clinical care. So if, you're, if you, uh, and don't worry about diagnosis. You've been diagnosed with something. You've been diagnosed with depression or anxiety or uh, high blood pressure or you're pre-diabetic um, or you have migraines. And you get a diagnosis and then there is this empirical process that your clinician goes through if you are fortunate enough to have a clinician and a single clinician over time uh, who goes through and tries to figure out what medication and at what dose works for you. I'm simplifying for the process. There's at least one doctor in the audience, but he's used to me um, playing a, a doctor on, on, on television. So um, you go through this process because we now, and it'll be another long period of time before you can just run some blood tests and know exactly what to give somebody and at what dose. For some things, we have that precision, but for many, many things, we don't. People respond differently for different medications, and we just don't know why. A close colleague at uh, Wild Cornell, uh, Kurt Cole, once said many years ago that um, once an individual is on more than one medication, there is no evidence base. We always talk about evidence-based medicine, right? You better practice evidence-based evidence -based medicine. You can't just wing it, right? It's not the most appropriately creative of disciplines from that perspective because we don't understand enough about the human body to just... Uh, uh, make a bunch of inferences or suppositions about what might work. And certainly, when it comes to medication, we don't know how you exactly are going to respond. And the reason, in particular, when you're on more than one medication, there's interaction between medications, and then there's your particular genomics, but there's also your particular microbiome, and there's your particular exposure and how long you lived next to that freeway that had PM 2.5. So there's so many variables in the problem that it is still and will be for a while an empirical process. Okay, so how does the clinician know if you're responding well to a medication? So if it's a, something they can measure, like is your blood pressure better controlled? Is your cholesterol level better controlled? That gives them that feedback on the uh, symptom that they're trying to manage, that particular factor. But what about the side effect? What if your statin that's trying to control your cholesterol actually causes you leg cramps and is interfering with your sleep? And that's a whole different other set of, of health implications. Or if your high blood pressure medication <clears throat> makes you dizzy, and so like many people, not always for that reason, they stop taking it. So many chronic conditions, when you're put on a medication, you're supposed to take it more or less forever for the rest of your life. And uh, the statistics on actually adhering to that is very poor. There can be many reasons. It could just be co-pays. It could be inconvenience. But it can also be because that dose isn't right. So one of the ideas of this data is to give to the clinician better information about how you're actually doing. Antidepressants, anti-anxiety. The data you generate about the hours in which you're sleeping, how much you're out of the house on the weekend, how late you come back, whether you're getting to class, and whether those are trending better or worse as you're coming into a, 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 a treatment by your clinician, that's where the small data serves as feedback to clinical care. Similarly, um, I don't know, I'm not going to ask you to, to raise your hand, but I take various, I don't take vitamins anymore, right? but I do take various supplements. Why do I take them? Not so clear. Right? Is there a scientific evidence that that supplement works for me? Not so clear, okay? But I, I, I'm not the only one, right? Whether it's Whole Foods or on Amazon, that's, there's a lot of this stuff being sold and consumed. And we maybe decide that when we take this, you know, glucosamine or turmeric, you know, that my, you know, I don't have problems with my knees when I'm running, whatever the thing is, right? And we try it, and maybe we decide it works, or maybe we decide it doesn't. But that's a, not a very scientific process. 
We don't try it for a while. How long should you try it? How long do you have to take that step before it actually works? The, but all of that self-care, including like gluten-free or whatever it is that you've decided to take out of your diet because it makes you feel better. So the idea is that being more systematic, letting individuals be more systematic at actually using their data to inform whether those changes make a difference. And then of course there's the research evidence. Because for many of these things, there just isn't an ev ev evidence base. I remember early on working with a dermatologist. Some of those kids at Boyle Heights said that the thing they wanted was help with their acne. And they wanted to know that if they ate differently, you know, would they have less acne? High school, fine. So I asked a dermatologist if we were to help them write a little thing that would let them do some analysis of whether X caused them their acne to be worse, like, how long will that take? What's the time constant of when you eat something to having a response? No evidence, no number for me, because by and large, it's not something necessarily, uh, necessarily studied. So lots of research to drive here as well. Uh, if I, um, this is like that, uh, uh, like that uh, video, this slide sort of represents a lot of where I've spent time over the last uh, decade. Um, more recently than that, uh, 2017, okay, so probably like seven years after that, um, I was, uh, I don't know if you've read anything by Atul Gawande. If you have not read anything by Atul Gawande, read what he writes. Not just what he writes, but how he writes. Just simply a, a brilliant um, and talented individual. And uh, this particular uh, piece that came out in um, 2017, now three years ago, was about the heroism of incremental care. He himself is a surgeon, and what he wrote about was, we love rescue medicine, and most of the, you know, uh, uh, whether it's Grey's Anatomy or whatever the stuff you see on, in the movies and on television is about trauma, emergency, uh, uh, very difficult surgeries, but that a lot of people connected back to that fact that a third of our mortalities actually are tied to uh, uh, behaviors and 50% of people have have, have a chronic disease at least, that a lot of what people struggle with are not these things that require surgery, but are things that require painstaking incremental care. That feedback loop of the clinician helping you figure out what is causing your migraines and what you can do and what works for you to try to reduce the extremity of those symptoms when they happen, uh, for example. And, uh, and so um, that, uh, this quote up here, um, uh, really uh, he's tried to call for, and since then, paying more attention to the technology and the science that can drive better incremental care. Incremental is often seen as a not interesting word, as a, as a pejorative term relative to novel, um, but I really uh, imp appreciate uh, his um, expression of this need. Whoops. Mouse is the wrong place. There we go. Uh, and then uh, just another one of the things that really uh, brought this home for me, not didn't mean that as a pun, was thinking about my parents as well, particularly in their later uh, and their last decade of, of life. They both lived to be 90 and had um, pretty amazing lives, which started in this uh, great city of New York. So people have always asked me, you know, oh, welcome back, or you must be happy to be back in New York, or you must be a New Yorker, and people have been thinking I'm a New Yorker since, at least since I went to, uh, uh, to grad school. So when I was at MIT, particularly in Boston, short, talk fast, dark hair, certain ethnic features, you must be from New York. Uh, and so I am finally from New York, and that started uh, with my parents. But the connection here was that particularly as I was um, in retrospect, when my, uh, when my father passed away, he became, he's a very, really, he had lots of illnesses, but he was a healthy and robust 90-year-old. And then suddenly, he started declining, and we didn't know what was going on. And one of the experiences was taking him to an emergency room, because he just, like, he could barely move, he wasn't functioning right that morning, and we had no diagnosis, right? And the emergency doctor looked at me like, he's 90. What's your problem? Right? He's presenting like a normal 90-year-old. 
but he hadn't seen my father two months before. And so that notion of, you know, what can we do? It's not that it would have saved his life. He had a great life. He was in his last time of life. I think the only thing it might have given him is my father might have known. My father might have been able to know if somebody had done one more scan that he was in his last weeks. So you might say, I don't want to know. He would have wanted to know. And uh, that really brought home and brought personal this notion of trying to think more and more and deeply about how to use these data uh, to, to inform that because I realized, wait a minute, when did he stop answering my email? Wait a minute, when did he stop doing his walks around the block, which he was a, you know, a, 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 one of his just uh, daily routines? And all those things had happened, but those data were not things that I had uh, access to or had looked at. So what type of data are we talking about? There are some straight sort of forward sort of things that I've talked about, like self-report and journaling apps, but there's also chatbots. So when you interact with chatbots, you're leaving behind your answers, your exchange uh, to that data. There are things like active tasks. So when clinicians are deciding whether somebody, um, uh, particularly an older person, is ready for surgery, they have a test. And that test does not have to do with drawing blood or any kind of uh, uh, radiology or imaging. It's called the get up and go test, which is get up and go, right? You get up and walk across the room. And there are all sorts of things that are measured in that process because it's a very integrative, neurological, cognitive, and, um, uh, and physiological uh, measure. So there are other kinds of tests like that. Think of somebody with Parkinson's and the best example, uh, uh, Sage Bio Networks, and some folks doing it, one of the best mobile research studies um, that had been out here today back in 2015, took the standard Parkinson's test, which is one of many for looking at how is somebody's um, uh, tremor being managed by their medication, and put it on the surface of the mobile phone. So that a couple times a day, or as frequently as was clinically of interest, they could check what somebody's acuity was of doing this without having a doctor view them. The value of that is, you know, as you're, as you're managing Parkinson's, which is now something that people live and are, you know, very active with for many years, but you're on increasing amounts of medication. You're trying to manage the timing of that medication. You want coverage, but you don't want to interfere with, um, you know, other organ systems that have to process it or keeping you up at night. And so you want that kind of detailed information about how, as you're increasing somebody dose over time in what's an inherently progressive disease, getting really fine grained information to serve that clinical loop. So think of that, uh, the data that you might collect from somebody from that tapping test, from standing on one leg, um, other kinds of basic uh, uh, physiological uh, tests that you can capture in different ways. You might capture that tremor in the voice also through interactions with an interactive voice agent like a Google Home uh, or uh, Siri or Alexa. There is the passive data. Um, one of the first types of data we started collecting, it's not just sort of how many steps you take, it's uh, what is your, um, really your diurnal rhythm. How are you, at, you've gone through surgery, you had your hip replaced, you've had your, uh, uh, you know, a, a sports injury that you're recovering from, and you can see how somebody is recovering as you start to see the diameter of their day grow. A, uh, an orthopedist pointed this out to me a long time ago at, at, at UCLA. He says, I ask my patients, um, sort of where do they take their walk? Because I try to get them to walk after their surgery. And initially, they only go around the block. And then they go around the block, and they go around, they go around their block several times. But it's only when I know that they're comfortable enough to cross the street, because they can cross before the light turns red, right, that they have the confidence to be able to cross that street is really a sign of them being able to return back to functional use. And that's all visible in our location traces and in our passive uh, uh, activity data. And now, of course, we have really, it used to be that we could only tell if you weren't sleeping because you were on your phone. So there was the digital trace of you not sleeping. But now, as we're understanding much more about I, a lot of people have understood this for a long time, but as many more of us are understanding 
the vital importance of sleep and sleep quality and sleep quantity, um, the ability to sense that, this is a, the Aura Ring, I own no stock in it, I'm just a big fan. Um, it's a very lightweight, really excellent uh, sensing device, measures temperature uh, and heart rate and movement and they have enough data now and they had enough tag data to develop really good machine learning models so that they capture your stage of sleep really very well. Um, and even if it's not as good as you would get in a sleep lab in terms of the absolute number, it trends really well. So on, uh, even if a sleep, even if this underestimates, as some people say, exactly how much REM sleep I get, if I'm uh, trying to adjust some behavior that affects my REM sleep, I can use this as feedback. Because when I'm getting more REM sleep, this reads more. The absolute value doesn't matter in that feedback system uh, as much as does it actually correlate, do the trends actually correlate. So uh, that's all passive data, which is increasingly available and increasingly affordable uh, to more and more people. And um, then there's also this element of digital traces that are just from our interactions online. Um, and uh, I'll say uh, a little bit um, uh, more about that if I have time. So uh, from participatory sensing to human sensing systems, it's been quite a while since I and a community of people started working on it. And I will say, like as with other things in tech, I really expected a sort of a revolution. Um, I expected things to happen much faster because they were very evident to us as technologists that they could be happening. And, um, but as is the case in healthcare, which is difficult, it's much harder than banking, and it's much harder than you know, social media engagement. It's a, just a much harder problem. Um, we needed time for more evolution, including just really for these devices to be in so many people's pockets so that in developing approaches you were serving with equity, uh, you know, the potential to serve a larger community. And also, it's just over that decade that electronic health records were slowly being adopted for better and worse. Um, but really, without a digital infrastructure behind, you're not going to, uh, uh, you know, expecting there to be that much uh, deployment of digital infrastructure on patients uh, wasn't very realistic. So, good things are happening. Um, uh, Apple uh, Health for iOS now gives people who have iPhones the ability to download your health records and so be integrated into your, into your care. Um, there's a group, uh, I'm on their advisory board for them, that's doing the same thing for Android, so Common Health. And if you are part of, you probably are part of Columbia Healthcare. Do your students get Columbia Healthcare? You don't know. Anyway, I'm assuming you're, no? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Okay, we can have that conversation later. Anyway, you probably, knowing Barnard, it, it is giving you good health care, right? For a lot of people, they go between doctors, particularly if something comes up, their kid has developed some condition or they themselves are developing a condition. You're going around between uh, specialists and there's no way for one specialist to see the data of the other. This whole problem of coordinated care, suddenly your, your parent is sick, maybe in another city, maybe in another country, and you're trying to figure it out and help them navigate. And the information and the data that exists, such as my father's clinical records were in some other server that was literally across the street from that emergency room where the doctor was, but not visible to them. So the idea of uh, a starting by helping to get digital data to flow between healthcare systems to get them to agree on sharing that data is a very slow, sloggy process. But maybe if you put the person in control of their own data, uh, they can do that um, and facilitate it. We have things starting to happen. MSK has this, uh, uh, this um, great example introduced last year of something that does symptom tracking, patients undergoing cancer care. A lot happens when you're undergoing cancer care. And uh, you know, you, you're, under, you're in chemo or radiation and you can get an infection and you're recovering from surgery and it's a very complex and intense time and patients have lots of questions and when they get scared, or when their worried spouse or, or parent or, or, or child gets scared, 
they go to the emergency room in the hospital. And you could think, well, that's where they'll get the best care, but that's also where they'll get the most exposure to infections when they have a suppressed immune system. So what uh, MSK built was something that helps to give feedback to the patients based on their condition and on how they're being treated to give them better guidance on whether what they're experiencing is pretty much in the realm of normal, you know, three days after treatment or five days after treatment to give them better guidance. And that involves them reporting on their symptoms as well as data coming down from the from the uh, from electronic health, health record to inform the particular care they're getting. Uh, I mentioned active tests before uh, the tapping test. I, uh, tapping test I had mentioned um, something similar to the get up and go. Different cognitive tests that you can do as just really quick interactions uh, on the phone uh, that are more engaging than something like a survey and can be done much more uh, much more frequently. And uh, another favorite example of mine by a very close colleague, uh, Tenzin Chowdhury, who's a uh, Cornell uh, faculty member. And she also has a, uh, a startup called Health Rhythms. And they have built tools through very close collaborations with uh, psychiatrists and, and psychologists to help individuals in managing uh, more severe mental illness, um, uh, more severe depression, as well as uh, bipolar uh, disorders. And one of the key ways in which you clinicians uh, help uh, individuals by helping them maintain uh, 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 very more stable diurnal rhythms, sleep patterns, meal patterns, and instead of that just being on paper as it has been, that now manifests itself in an app that doesn't require you to self-report and remember, you know, sometimes you've slept a lot but it feels like you haven't, and sometimes you've slept enough, it feels like you've slept enough but you actually uh, haven't, and so not having to have that um, subjective self-report can be captured by what's going on on the cell phone and help the individual and their clinician uh, better manage their condition. So things have progressed much more slowly than I expected them to 10 years ago, um, but things have progressed. And I, where are we now with respect to the outstanding research challenges? I sort of think of them as falling into two buckets. One of them really is in sense making that can actually be used by a clinician in the seven minutes they have to find out how you are in a three month or six month or three year checkup and be able to use that data. If you give them a bunch of data, that's not something that can work in a clinical encounter. It's as if they're taking a blood sample and they have to do the analysis themselves, right? We don't do things that way. You send, you send out the lab to some lab comes up and comes back with what are standardized measures, HbA1c, you know, the amount of, uh, of glucose in your blood over some period of time. So we need to develop those same overall uh, averaged, um, representative, meaningful digital biomarkers out of these diverse uh, data. And that's still a, very much a, a work in progress and is a combination of, uh, of, of work by people who know a lot about on the health side, uh, people who know a lot about sort of user-centered design and what is it that will be meaningful to patients, but also what's meaningful to a clinician. Uh, you know, a clin clinicians and informing their decision making, you have to uh, make the information actionable to them. So that's one uh, class. And another one is privacy. So as from that early example and peer, right, there is it, there is this problem of not presenting the clinician with too much information because they just won't be able to make a decision. They won't be able to interpret it. We have to address that problem, but also we have to uh, uh, be respectful and not, um, and hopefully not just sort of adopt full scale surveillance because it happens to be convenient for something, right? I talk a lot about chronic disease, right? But what's been going on in the world in the last, uh, two months is in chronic disease, it's infectious disease. And, you know, I don't know, you've probably had these conversations. I don't, can't tell you the number of people who have sent me an email or s students that I hear speaking in the hallway saying, well, clearly what we should do, right, is be tracking people or look at people's location history so we can know whether they were in contact or once you find out that somebody has a virus, they can go back and see who they were in contact with for the past two weeks. And it's a compelling comment in the face of 
these kinds of issues. And yet, if we just do that with complete granularity, like how do you ever pull back from it? That level of complete surveillance for the sake of some social good is like a, you know, if there's not sort of a fundamental, uh, you know, issue of our, not our age, but our month, <laughs> that would sort of uh, uh, clearly be it. I do not have, um, I do not have a magic answer, um, just to uh, mention that some of the work going on in sense making, um, and I know I just have a couple minutes, uh, we, um, is, has been held back because of lack of availability to data. And one of the places that we've uh, found that we can get access to more data to just drive the research to figure out what the model should be to pull out digital bar markers is actually by recruiting people into studies under IRB with very close protection of how those data are used to help to understand how their retrospect, what their retrospective data might say. And Google is, uh, has been wonderful and for the lo a long time opening up APIs by which individuals can get access to their own data and then if they are, uh, adroit, agree to join the study, they can make that data, data available um, in a protected way to researchers. Um, the, the, the threats associated with the availability of this data, though from a privacy perspective, from a surveillance perspective, from a, at some level, democracy perspective, when our every moment's location um, uh, is surveilled, um, is very real and will require law and technology. But there are technology choices that we've, we've made along the way or have been made along the way, not necessarily for nefarious purposes, but for convenience. The fact that it's, when you share your location, um, and historically there's very little granularity selection, only now, I don't know if you've noticed, at least on my Android phone, I don't know when that was introduced, sometime in the last six months or so, when apps are accessing your location, you get a notice. This app is accessing your location and you can now, instead of just the binary, an app can get my location or it can't, I don't even remember when it was introduced in Android, I'm not looking at you, Ramon. Um, you can choose only allow the app to access my location when I'm using the app. That's a big difference. And those kinds of design choices are possible. They're not always the most commercially um, advantageous thing to do, but it is something that we as a society, uh, through law, through our investments, through the kinds of products we choose to build, um, can actually uh, influence. So uh, just for my last minute, um, I uh, had the opportunity to come to this amazing city uh, when Cornell Tech was first established, so I joined as their as their first faculty to join in January of 2013, when, the, when this southern part of Roosevelt Island didn't look like this. It still had a very old, uh, already um, uh, uh, hospital that was no longer uh, being used. And, in the, um, and my colleagues who hired me from uh, Cornell uh, had already made the plans for this building so that uh, five years later, after we started, we were able to uh, uh, to move in, and these are is uh, the first three buildings. There are now two more uh, uh, that exist as to phase one of the campus. It might seem like it's really far away, but it's just a nice tram ride over um, from 60th and 2nd Avenue. Um, and we have a faculty that started with one person, and now we have a pretty great grid of faculty. Uh, we're missing, like we just, the, if you go to the web page, it's like this, so I added my cat. Um, as a, as a distinguished uh, it, it, uh, adopted member of our faculty, but we have a rich faculty that are, you know, cover robotics and AI and HCI and security and privacy. And we're also very much uh, dedicated, invested from the beginning to impact um, both our faculty who are very involved commercially as well as with uh, public good applications. Um, this is our main auditorium and it's a picture we took on our opening semester with a person who's becoming even more famous than he was before. Um, if you see, he came and surprised our students, Bloomberg, by sitting in the audience with them. He also uh, paid for the building, so yeah. Um, and I just wanted to make a last few comments about broader impact. Um, we've always, from the beginning, had a, as part of our mission to work on computing in K through 12. And I mentioned this in particular because it's part of our mission, but also because my colleague, uh, Diane Levitt, is a Barnard alum.
for back from 1980. I've known her uh, for many, many years. And uh, she runs and is the strategic and creative energy beyond, uh, behind what we do in New York City and the education system. And we also um, have been working very closely uh, with CUNY, developed a women in, uh, Judy Spitz developed a Women in Technology in New York that really tries to address pipeline issues beyond uh, K through 12. And they were just um, uh, awarded funding uh, by um, Pivotal Ventures and others to bring that same approach to additional cities. The next one will be Chicago. Um, but that's sort of the, uh, the greatest compliment you can get in terms of an impact program is when somebody wants to invest in replicating it in other places. Uh, so with that, I will. So that was great. I mean, the bread and um, I'm wondering about your health data. And you know, there's data you can collect with this and data you can You're well aware of Yes. That. And I'm wondering whether, how much the data that is collected is being used with big data to help physicians diagnose. And can you give us an estimate of how useful that's been? Or I mean, it'll get more useful as we learn the correlations between sleep and healthcare. Exactly. But I'm wondering is what what you see now and what you see the trajectory. So, um, there are like different reasons. By and large, I have to give you just a yes/no answer. Not being used and not very useful. Okay. But I do not put it that I do not attribute that to the actual uh, richness of the data, our ability to come up with a reasonable summary summation of it. I put it to the fact that it's not clear how it fits into the incentive structure of our healthcare system to get things like that adopted. It's not clear who makes money from it, who saves money within the time frame that people measure, like in an actuarial table or things like that. It's just, we have a pretty irrational healthcare system. And I sort of, I and others sort of approach this as that, oh, this can help as if there's some rational actor trying to just help you do better management of your health. <coughs> so it is much, it has come to fruition, and I have like spent months at a time deciding, forget it. Like I'm, I'm just, you know, and I am sort of regularly on the verge of that, of that again. But I, it's slowly happening, right? You're starting to see it in apps that MSK puts out there that makes a difference in people who are going through their, it is, so it's not exactly in the places I thought, but um, I think in psychiatry, we're starting to see some of the power of that in this particular context. Um, has it helped in the basic prevention behaviors that drive people to develop these conditions. Um, another one that's really hard, right? What we need to do there is change our food system and in the meantime, help people somehow to navigate what they're exposed to in our food system. So um, the struggle continues, but thank you for keeping me honest by making it clear that this has not revolutionized anything yet. So I'm going with what Barbara was saying. Um, yeah, it, it is you know, a, a, a study that everybody quotes, which is that it's about 17 years when innovation is, takes place when it's actually implemented more broadly in practice. Um, and that's, you know, that gap is something that sort of exists in, in healthcare and probably in lots of other industries as well. But, you know, one, one, but if you think about the kind of stuff you're talking about, it really hits at sort of three different levels that, you know, that are sort of active in terms of the you know, research and actual clinical practice. One is the movement for precision medicine. That is our ability to actually genotype individual people and understand what their genetic makeup is and make sense of it. Yeah. Um, and then link it to actual clinical phenomena. Um, and that is relatively early, but you know, at Columbia we're, you know, we're one of the main centers for yep. the All of Us project that's yep. genotyping literally tens of thousands of people um, to begin to make sense of that. And to link it not just genes, but also with these small behaviors that you're talking about would be a huge kind of a project of sense making out of that yep. um, that is going to be very complicated to do. At the second level, you know, your, your point about chronic disease, um, that uh, you know, there's a thing called the chronic disease model that was developed by people at Kaiser in, in Seattle, uh, at Wagner, 
Um, and it was based on the assumption that if a bunch of Martians came down and looked at our healthcare system, they would think it was designed for people who had either appendicitis or uh, otitis media. Yeah. Um, it's set up as an acute care You're system. You're When 85, yeah, when 85 percent of the morbidity in the country is from chronic diseases, as you said, and the fundamental component of the chronic care model is what's called negative-based care. Um, exactly what Rwanda was talking yeah. about. That you're, you know, you need to. We don't really know what totally works for each individual, so we measure it in a systematic, longitudinal way, uh, and you have you know, time, time, and then you make adjustments, you know, such so-called step care, yeah. based upon whether somebody's getting better. Um, and that's sort of the, um, and then the third level is, which is I, I hadn't thought about it until you talked about it very early is that there's a whole movement towards sort of community involvement in the from community-based participatory research. Yep. And in some ways, what you were describing from at the very first example is that is, people haven't, haven't framed it this way, but it's an example of community-based yep. participatory research. That's what I call you know, participatory yep. research. You know, to engage people from the community yep. in ways that um, get at the priorities of the community um, to deal with the diversity of the community. And right. But none of these are there. I mean, it's, I, I come up with lots of excuses in my head because I think about this. This is all true. And yet it's not done very much. So why? And really, a lot of this could have started doing this a decade ago. There's no problem. Right. So why? It also has to do with the incentive structures and the way innovation happens in health and healthcare and in other aspects of things and sort of one of my interests is in increasing the amount of work we do in things that are driven to address public interest needs uh, as to, to balance out what is driving our, our tech uh, ecosystem and what students choose to do and spend their time on. I spend time in commercial enterprises and, 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 and uh, always have, and that's important stuff, and that's how we bring product to market to enable any of these things. But it's also uh, great opportunities to move into that space and build things in the public interest.